So over the last couple of fellowships, we've looked at covenants. And we started by looking at the covenants in the Old Testament. And one of the things we noticed is how each successive covenant added to those already given. It did not override or nullify any previous covenant. And then we looked at how we as Gentiles have now been brought into the fold. We've been included in to the covenant and the promises of Christ. We were aliens. We were strangers from the Commonwealth of Israel. But now we have been brought close. We've been brought nigh through Christ. And today, um, hopefully we'll now get through the, the last part of the covenants by looking at what is known or what is called the new covenant, which was instituted by the sacrifice of Christ and ratified through the resurrection and ascension. The new covenant, it kind of supersedes all the other covenants in that it takes them all to a higher level. What was a heart of stone in the old covenant becomes a heart of flesh in the new covenant. What was flesh in the old covenant is spirit in the new covenant. What was unnatural in the old covenant becomes natural in the new covenant. The new covenant comes into its fullness. It, it, the, the whole thing comes together with the return of Christ when we are resurrected. Everything we have today is a token, a down payment of what is to come. As Paul said in Corinthians, today we see through a glass darkly. Romans puts it this way. Not only creation which groans and travails in pain together until now, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. We have the down payment, we have the token, we have the first fruits of the spirit, but we all know life and everything about life is not perfect now. We are complete in Christ, but we're still waiting for the manifestation of that. We still need everything that God promises to us at the return of Christ. The return of Christ brings everything to its fullness. Until then, we are still on the path to the kingdom. It's once, it's all, everything comes together with the, turn, with, with the return of Christ. So what is this new covenant? Well, first and foremost, Jesus Christ is the mediator of this new covenant. The new covenant includes the promise that God will forgive sin and restore fellowship with those whose hearts are turned towards him through Christ. And Christ's death on the cross is the basis of the new covenant. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, this is what we refer to as the Last Supper. After, they had, after he broke the bread and passed that around, verse 20 says, And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus Christ announced the new covenant would come into part of this, this new covenant would be when he gave his life on the cross. The new covenant is in my blood. Now, you can be turning to Jeremiah chapter 31. This new covenant, this, this is not the first time the Bible talks about the new covenant. In the Old Testament, the prophets Moses, Jeremiah and Ezekiel all foretold of aspects of this new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 
And in verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So, one day, God's saying, I'm going to make a new covenant. Now jump to verse 33. For this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And remember, Ephesians, we were aliens, but now we were and strangers from God's covenants and promises in Christ. But now we are brought close. We are brought nigh. We are one body. We are, we are grafted in to Israel. So this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, which we know all down in the future includes Gentiles. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Part of this new covenant, one aspect that Jeremiah tells us about is that God would write his law his word within them. In essence, see the law, I think every now and again I get on this thing about the law. The law, the law is so, it gets such a bad rap. Because the law basically is God saying, this is how you should live. That you should live in love. You should not lie, steal, lust, commit murder, you know, be greedy for everything everything that everybody else has got. That is God's way that we should live. But we just can't do it because we've got a sin nature. We always fall at some point. But what God's saying here is, I'm going to write my law in your hearts so you will naturally want to do what is right. It will be within our hearts to do what is right. God's going to write it on the tables of our heart and I will be their God and they will be my people one day we'll look at that it's a wonderful promise that God has through his word let's go over to the book of Ezekiel Isaiah Jeremiah Lamentations Ezekiel Daniel and Ezekiel also talks about the new covenant in Ezekiel chapter 36, we'll pick it up, we'll read verses 26 and 27. I will give you a new heart. And in that new heart, the word of God will be written on it. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws see you know that closing phrase in jeremiah says i will be their god and they shall be my people there's this fundamental disconnect between god and mankind because of sin and the sin nature within man God is holy God is righteous God is light and in him is no darkness we're not there yet but in this new covenant we will have a new heart instead of a heart of stone that will not soak up God's word and live it God will give us a heart of flesh that will soak up God's word and will naturally be inclined they the heart will want to be careful to keep God's word now let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy but you guys are getting more familiar with the Old Testament in these fellowships <laughs> Genesis Exodus Leviticus Numbers Deuteronomy the fifth book of the Bible and in Deuteronomy 30 <coughs> now In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy's chapters 28, 30, 28, 29 and 30 are just phenomenal chapters in the Bible. They really are. And <clears throat> part of this chapter, Moses is telling the children of Israel, God has not given you a heart to understand God. 
You haven't got the heart to understand the law. And in verse 6, it says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Within this new covenant, this new covenant involves a total change of heart so that God's people are naturally pleasing to him. In this new covenant, the heart of stone will become a heart of flesh. And as it says here, as Moses said, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. One of the symbolic things about circumcision is that you're cutting off the flesh. And that's putting off the old man, that heart of the, the heart of the flesh, but putting on the new man in Christ. So three aspects of this new covenant. The heart, a heart that is circumcised, that puts off the old man, the, the man of the flesh. A heart that is circumcised so that you may love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. A new heart of the flesh to replace the heart, the, the heart of stone. God's law, God's law, how to live rightly will be written within our hearts. We will, there will not be that internal fight to stand up against sin. Lust will not enter the heart of the man in the new covenant. The natural heart will be, how do I help? How do I bless? What can I do to help? It will be to walk in the love of God. That will be the natural state. And spirit, God will put a new spirit which will move you to keep God's laws. The new covenant involves God's laws of life being written on the believer's heart through the spirit so that they were to have a heart of flesh that will love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. See, we read these promises and when you meditate upon them and you think about them, you think that's that state of fellowship that we possibly long to be in. You know, it's like Romans 7, but, you know, Paul has knew as much as Paul knew and understood and lived for God, he knew that within himself, he still had sin. And But through Christ, that he breaks the power of sin. But still, we're waiting for that full redemption. So let's talk about Jesus. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> so back in the New Testament now, so you can all relax. I'm joking when I say that, obviously. 1 Corinthians 15, and let's pick it up in verse 42. So, we're talking in these verses about the resurrection. Jesus was a man. He was a man of flesh and blood of the seed of Abraham. And as a man, he died. But he was raised again with a spirit-based life force. This is an amazing truth to, to learn and to realize and understand. <clears throat> so, 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. The natural man of body and soul is perishable. Jesus died as a natural man of body and soul. What is sown is perishable. What is raised the res at the resurrection is incorruptible. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Listen to this. Pay close attention. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, 
the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, a life-giving spirit. So the natural man, all of us that live our lives today, when we die, we're dead. Jesus Christ, as a man, died. But God immediately raised him from the dead after three days and three nights. But when God raised Jesus from the dead, he was raised with a life-giving spirit. Today, our soul life gives life to our body. With the resurrection, it's a spirit that gives life to our new spiritual bodies. We know that Paul looked forward to being clothed with the spiritual body like unto his glorious body. That's part of our hope. It's also part of the new covenant. <clears throat> now, I want to kind of take a step back a little bit. Because I wanted to sort of lay that foundation. But it would only be right to talk about this, that one important aspect of the new covenant is with regard to the sacrificial system which was set up as part of the old covenant under the law of Moses. As part of the new covenant, Jesus offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to atone for man's sin. Not only did he die on our behalf, but God raised him from the dead and Jesus ascended into heaven itself, into the heavenly holy of holies as a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now Hebrews chapters 7, 8 and 9 go over the details of all of this. Hebrews 8, as a matter of fact, Hebrews 8 quotes the verses we read from Jeremiah regarding the new covenant. And from what I understand, it quotes the whole verses that that's the longest quote in the New Testament, quoting a scripture from the Old Testament. So there is that whole aspect of the new covenant, as Jesus said in Luke, the new covenant which is poured out in my blood. That, that there's a whole aspect of that new covenant where his blood is the atonement for sin that's better than any of the blood of bulls and goats and any of the sacrificial animals. So that is a whole different aspect of the new covenant and that really deserves its own study. Um, but I want to look at a different aspect of the new covenant, which is to see how the new covenant lives in part in the lives of God's spirit-filled children today. Uh, you could be turning to Ephesians chapter 1. The new covenant in all its fullness is a reality for Jesus. I want you to think about this for a minute. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, he is no longer all of those things that are listed in 1 Corinthians, the state of the natural man, the state of the man living today, but as a raised individual. He is the only one that has been raised from the dead and given that new body, given that life-giving spirit within him. He, because of that resurrection, and the new life that God has given him. The fullness of God's promises are now complete in Christ. He's raised from the dead with a new spiritual body, never to die again. Jesus Christ was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. I mean, the, the earthly Jesus was perfect, right? Well, the heavenly Jesus is even more perfect. So the fullness of all of God's promises are now a living reality to Jesus Christ.
It will be a full reality for us when we are gathered together. But in the meantime, God has given us a token of his spirit, a down payment. And it's a pledge that he will also give us the full amount, just as Jesus has now, we will have at the return of Christ and in the resurrection. The spirit we have today is a token, a down payment on what will fully come into its completeness at the time of the resurrection of the just. Because remember, Romans again says, I, I groan within myself waiting to be clothed with the body from on high. So Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm reading from the King James. In whom ye also trusted, regarding Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession until the praise unto the praise of his glory. So the key word there that we're interested in today is earnest, which um, translated earnest in the King James. It's the Greek word arabon and its description is an earnest money which in purchases is given as a pledge or a down payment that the full amount will subsequently be paid. So the spirit that we have received is a down payment. It's a token. In Old English, it's an earnest. I'll read you that phrase from various different translations so you really get the sense of what this verse is telling us. The ESV says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. This spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. The Holy, the CSB says the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. The NASB 20 says who is the first installment. I mean I'm kind of belaboring this point because I really want us to get the fact what we have today is not the fullness. It's a down payment. It's a guarantee that God will fulfill the rest at the time, at the purchase of the redemption, which is the return. The NASB 95 says, who is given as a pledge. It's God's pledge that he will fulfill at the return. The NLT says the spirit is God's guarantee. I think we've seen that one before. So we can see from the various translations that this word is called an earnest, a guarantee, a down payment, a first installment, a pledge. You know, we today might just say, well, it's like a deposit. You're putting down a deposit. God has put down a deposit. See, we're not, we haven't got the fullness it's not a done deal yet. Okay, it's not a done deal. We've got a down payment, a token. And with any transaction, the there is a requirement of faithfulness. When you buy a house, you put a down payment down. But you're required to continue to make all your payments and then finally the house is yours. Our continued down payment is our lives in faithfulness to God. We walk along that path. God has given us a token, a down payment. We respect that by continuing to be faithful to God. This word occurs only three times. Uh, the first one is in 2 Corinthians, which is, says, basically says the same thing. It says exactly the same thing as we've read in Ephesians. But if we keep reading in 2 Corinthians, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We see a wonderful example of how the spirit that we have now is a token of the new covenant. We have the new covenant in part and we'll see in what we're going to read the same usage of words, the same language, the same terminology. 
2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but written with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards you, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to claim anything as if coming from us, but our sufficiency is of God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, the law, kills, but the spirit gives life. Look at how many, phrase, look at the phraseology in that. Paul is saying, I have sent you, I have taught you the word, and you are going out there now as a living epistle of Christ, with the spirit of God within you, the spirit of God writing the word of God on your heart. And it's no longer a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. All the same promises of the new covenant. And yet we know this is just a token. With the Spirit of God, God writes on the hearts of those who believe so that we become living epistles of Christ. Paul continues contra contrasting the letter of the law versus the Spirit. When we read this section, it reminds us of what we read in Deuteronomy regarding the circumcision of the heart. I'll just read that back to you. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that they will love the Lord their God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. God said at the time that they, Israel, it did not have a heart to know and understand. So keep this, keep this in mind as we read on. Let's jump down to verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 14, but their minds, referring now back to Israel, remember Israel, they were hard hearted. They had a heart of stone. They didn't have that heart of flesh. They didn't have the spirit of God. They didn't have the word written on the heart so they would naturally love God. So this is what Corinthians is talking about. But their minds, the minds of those children of Israel were hardened for to this day. When they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Because it's through Christ we receive the spirit and through the spirit, the veil is lifted. The heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. The spirit within us now causes us to understand spiritual things. Verse 15. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. There's a lot to take in there. There's a lot to think through and process. We have the Spirit of God within us. It's that token. It's a down payment. But through it, we can understand spiritual matters. With the Spirit of God in us, we look upon Christ. And as we look upon Christ... We are transformed into the same image, the image of Christ. One degree at a time. See, if we, if we were already perfect, if we were already had it all, we wouldn't be one degree at a time. But we build up one degree at a time. We look on Christ and that we are transformed into the image of Christ one degree degree at a time. 
just ask yourself a simple question. How much more do you understand the things of God now than you did when you first heard the, somebody first talk to you about the Bible? Obviously, your understanding, your knowledge has grown. Your ability to walk in fellowship, to keep your mind on track has grown it's strengthened that's because you continue you look upon christ and you are transformed from one degree one at one degree at a time we have all the ingredients of the new covenant now but in a measure we have a token we have a down payment we have a guarantee but we are still waiting to be clothed with the same body that Christ has. And we will get that at the return of Christ when we are resurrected. We continue to look up to him and continue to be transformed is into his image as we stay faithful to God through Jesus Christ. This new covenant is the fulfillment of God's plan for man. That man would return to a state like he walked with Adam, where there was open fellowship, open communication. It says that God made Adam in his own image. That image of God that was created in Adam is the same as the image of Christ that we are transformed into. Jesus walked perfectly with his heavenly father. God said, this is my son, beloved son, listen to him, because he spoke God's word, he did God's will. As we look upon Christ, we take our eyes off the world and we look on Christ. And that's where we see the godly traits. That's where we see the godly habit patterns that we want to build into our lives. This new... This new covenant, it's the be all and end all of what we want to be. And it's there, but it's there as a token. And as I said before, everything about God's word and God's promises, they all come to pass. They all come together in Christ, but they all become a full living reality at the return. Until, until then, right now. We now have the promises of God. We have the spirit of God as a token within us. We know it's there. One of the beautiful things about speaking in tongues is it's kind of that evidence within you that Christ is in you. The hope of glory. It's the hope of glory. You know, we have that flicker right now. We're, look, we're looking for the full fire. So the new covenant is a wonderful thing to learn about and to see how it was promised in the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ, just before his death, he, he says, this is the new covenant which is poured out for you. His giving of himself is the, the first step in man, God's whole redemption for mankind. So... Let's close with a word of prayer. God, what you have done for us is just far above what our hearts and minds could ever dream or imagine. And we know you're very honest, God, and just and righteous. And you want every, every person to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And Father, for those of us that have heard the word of truth, I pray that we continue on that road, on that path towards your kingdom, that we don't turn to the left or to the right, but we look to you and we see your grace, we see your forgiveness, we see your love and we understand your tenderness. So Father, help us to, through your spirit, to write your word upon our hearts so that we too are living epistles of Christ that we walk in the love of Christ. We speak the words of Christ. And we have the, the tenderness and the love and the compassion that Christ showed to those who were around him. 
and those that he spoke to. And yet the firmness, God, and the commitment that nothing comes before you and that whatever goes against you, we go against that. That we make a stand, we make a distinction to show by our words and actions that we are Christ's and that Christ has been written on our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.